A record 100 million people forcibly displaced. The UN says the war in Ukraine has pushed the world into the staggering milestone. But will this be the wake-up call to resolve other conflicts? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Hashim Ahlbarra. It's being called a record that should never have been set. The UN's refugee agency says more than 100 million people have been forcibly displaced around the world. The figure was reached after the war in Ukraine pushed at least 14 million people from their homes. While the UNHCR praised the international response to help Ukrainians, it's urging the same level of compassion for other conflicts and crises. Rights groups have criticized Western nations for failing to welcome the vast majority of displaced people from Africa, the Middle East and Asia. The UN's High Commissioner for Refugees says the figure is a wake-up call to resolve global conflicts. There is not just Ukraine, that we should not forget all the rest. First of all, because Ukraine has an impact on many other fragile situations, making, it more fra making them more fragile, food security, energy crisis, uh, price increases, instability. And then this, in turn, can cause more displacement if you have countries uh, getting into unrest and into uh, political um, uh, fragility, you, we may see more displacement. So it is very important as we respond to Ukraine, and we will continue to to also pay adequate attention to crises in Africa, crises in the Middle East, crises in Latin America, crises in uh, Asia and so forth. Let's take a closer look at the numbers. By the end of last year, at least 90 million people were displaced, mainly coming from Ethiopia, Burkina Faso, Myanmar, Nigeria, Afghanistan and the Democratic Republic of Congo and Ukraine this year. And they mostly want, went to countries like Turkey, Jordan, Uganda, Pakistan, Lebanon, Germany, Sudan, Bangladesh, Iran and Ethiopia. The major causes are still conflict, violence and persecution, followed by natural disasters. But weather-related events like storms, floods, wildfires, droughts and extreme temperatures are becoming a growing trend. Let's bring in our guests in Nairobi, Nazani Mushiri, Senior Analyst for Climate and Security in Africa at the International Crisis Group. In Uppsala, Sweden, Jesper Bjørnesen, Senior Researcher at the Nordic Africa Institute. And in London, Pavati Nae, Professor of Migration Studies at Queen Mary University of London. Welcome to the program. Nazani, a staggering milestone. We're talking about 100 million people displaced more than 1% of the global population. Let's talk globally before we move to different parts of the world. Why is this staggering increase in the number of displacement? I think there are a number of reasons for this displacement. Um, I think, as you mentioned there, conflict, of course, is a major driver here um, in Africa, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, in Ethiopia, um, in the Horn region, uh, we have uh, major conflicts ongoing, and that is a major driver. Uh, but there are other drivers too. Um, as you mentioned there, climate, in terms of climate stresses, the extremes, this, the weather that we're seeing, the, the ongoing prolonged drought here uh, in the Horn region, uh, we're seeing uh, ma major weather disasters as well, storms, cyclones, flooding um, in parts uh, of the world. Those are also major factors which are leading to this staggering figure. But you have to remember as well that a lot of these people have been displaced time and time again. Mm -hmm. So those figures are staggering, that many people have been displaced and are moving Either, either internally within their own countries, for example, here in, in South Sudan, here in the Horn, mm -hmm. or moving across borders as well. Yes, per 38 million internally displaced people reported in 2021, 14 million Ukrainians 
displaced. You're getting a sense that this is showing no signs of abating at all. Well, to some extent, I agree with that. Um, unfortunately, we've seen an ever-increasing number of displaced people uh, globally. Um, and I think, as I agree with Natalie, that we have to look at the drivers of displacement and really uh, focus on what is what is forcing people on the move under those conditions. And there I would also emphasize that there's been a complete, or more or less complete failure in, in uh, halting armed conflict. Uh, I work mainly uh, in West Africa, and we've seen rather the opposite, the escalation of armed conflict with displacement uh, as a major consequence of these armed conflicts. So yes, those are sort of worrying trends and, and worrying figures. Uh, but I would also just want to mention that um, we, we, we rely a lot on CR for our understanding of displacement dynamics, and they do a fantastic job, not just in interventions, but also in collecting data. But there is this tendency also that as a charity-based organization, they do need to emphasize this ever-increasing number. It wouldn't look good uh, you know, towards donors to say that the trend is actually reversing. So I just mm -hmm. want to caution uh, against a narrative that also really pushes this uh, idea of an ever escalating and unending crisis. Okay. Pavati, do we have to spend more time now focusing on the drivers or the triggers when the, they combine? Because we have wars, conflicts, autocracy, climate change, and you get a sense sometimes that the international community is doing nothing to try to tackle this issue. Thank you. Thank you for this question. I think, uh, you know, it, it is not exactly true to say that the international community is doing nothing. In 2018, we had, you know, two major global compacts, which are not binding legal agreements, but nevertheless, you know, sort of commitments by countries um, to both address questions of safe, orderly uh, migration and also the question of cooperation around refugees. But I think that these compacts and agreements, um, good as they are, are taking second place or third place even in international priorities. And I think this is the problem. Uh, I do think that uh, it's, it's good to have a good understanding of drivers and triggers, but to talk in terms of drivers and triggers alone is not enough. Mm -hmm. I think the international community, and particularly the, the wealthier countries of the world, the global north, if you like, has a responsibility to really look at the way in which development is being propagated across the world globally, and to really have a much more people-centered and planet-centered approach. And that is vital if we're actually going to find a way forward because today it's 100 million and that means, you know, one out of 100 people maybe in the world. Um, but that means also that tomorrow it will be you, me and everyone else we know. So I think it's very, very important to have a very different uh, systemic approach to the question of human uh, displacement. Speaking of those approaches, Nazanin, when you look at Somalia and you see because of the ongoing conflict, the number of uh, displaced has been on the rise at the same time in Ethiopia because of the conflict in Tigray. But then the African Union, the international community, have not really been able to step in in a way or another that not only would put an end to that, those problems, but bring about a permanent solution to those conf conflicts. Yeah, I think access is a big issue. And also the fact that when you're talking about these, these uh, disasters, I guess, the focus is on immediate humanitarian aid, and it's not often on sustainable solutions, uh, which could be brought about by building resilience, you know, to climate issues, for example, in parts of these country, countries. So access in, in Tigray, as you know, is a real issue. Access in uh, areas, large swathes of Somalia, uh, are controlled by al-Shabaab in the south and central part of the country. So how can you even access those areas? How can you build sustainability when you are in, not in any dialogue at all with, with armed groups like al-Shabaab? So that is part of the problem. Yes, but when you look at the uh, war in Ukraine and the global attention, you just move forward to places like Western Africa or the Sahel region where the the challenges are massive. We're talking about a vast territory, 
larger than Europe on its own. And with the increase of instability, we're talking about a potential for millions and millions of people to be affected in the, in the future. However, you don't get that same sense of urgency and attention as far as the international community is concerned. I would agree with that observation. I think the Ukrainian crisis has brought out something that is not new and not particularly surprising, which is that Europe prioritizes people closest to its own borders, but also people who are closest to sort of uh, the, Europe's own vision of itself, if you want. So there is a racial aspect there, there's a cultural aspect, there's a linguistic aspect. So it seems much easier for European public opinion to sympathize with uh, Ukrainians displaced than, for example, with uh, people from Mali or Burkina Faso. Uh, and I think that's something we have to acknowledge. Um, and I also think that that um, Europe has perhaps have, I mean, I, I, Europe is an important uh, donor region in the world, but I think Europe has had too much of a say in the global conversation around uh, refugee protection, for example. And that is actually not really in line with the realities on the ground. I mean, more than 80% of the world's displaced people are actually hosted uh, in, the, in the global south. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the European understanding of who is worthy of solidarity and protection shouldn't be the only voice uh, in that conversation. Pavati, how to move forward? Because you get a sense that the international community is having an issue, particularly when it comes to impunity. You look at places like Yemen, like Syria, other places. Millions of people were killed, hundreds of thousands of people displaced. And ultimately, the international community is not doing what it should to prevent those atrocities from being uh, done again and again. Uh, absolutely, I would agree with you. I think, and I agree also, you know, with uh, what has been said just now, about the fact, you know, that the, the Ukrainian displacement, horrible and tragic as it is, uh, is nevertheless actually um, only what is the a recent tip, if you like, to this massive iceberg. And, uh, you know, the vast majority of displaced people are in what you know, in developing countries, and many are in, of course, Africa, but also Latin America. We have Venezuelans, we have, you know, Cubans, we have a large number of people on the move in Latin America, in, in Asia, of course, the Rohingya crisis has been existing for a long time long time so you know wherever you go now there is the, there is the presence of the refugee the internally displaced the migrant but there has been a distinct prioritization uh, which is of course racial as well as uh, to do with european identities um, particularly uh, here in the UK, for example, it's very interesting that the UK government has on the one hand opened up a channel whereby, you know, UK citizens can offer a home to Ukrainians, but at the same time, they are working on a deal with Rwanda to uh, send across mainly those who have been coming across or may come across from the channel uh, from France. And of course, we know that many of them are from conflict or post-conflict zones from mm -hmm. Africa, from Iraq, etc. So we see a very clear distinction. And I think that that uh, honesty is absolutely necessary on the table. Um, and yes, I also agree that a lot of the measures have been responsive or in reaction to rather than really tackling what is a global phenomenon. Nazanin, international <laughs> human rights organizations, NGOs operating on the ground, they raised the, this issue for, the, for, for a particular reason. They want it to come to an end and they don't want to see a repeat of it. But sometimes the urgent need is for donations, for donors to step in to provide assistance, tackle what they, they can tackle. Now, when it comes to inviting people to look at the root causes of the problem, that's where people say, you know what, this is really going to take ages and ages to solve. Yeah, I think that's definitely a huge issue. Um, and I concur with um, what was said on the painful contrast between um, the way that um, Ukrainian refugees um, have been treated um, and the way that refugees, say, from Somalia or Syria have been treated. Um, I think one of the issues that hasn't been raised, possibly, is the fact that what is happening in Ukraine um, is having a massive impact on 
uh, the potential for that aid that's desperately needed uh, right now um, here in the Horn where I am, and also, of course, um, in the Sahel region as well. Um, if we just take Somalia, for example, uh, Somalia is really reliant on uh, wheat from Russia and Ukraine, even before the war, heavily dependent on imported rice, vegetable oil, sugar, fuel. Um, and this has had a major impact on prices. I think food prices have increased by more than 140% uh, in Somalia, uh, which is extreme. Uh, so when you look at the aid that's needed to help people who have been displaced and the cost of that aid, the figures don't add up. It's impossible to really know how that gap will be filled. And I think this is a huge, huge issue and a big, big worry for people who are uh, trying to mm -hmm. help the vulnerable communities who have been impacted uh, by these many issues right now. Yes, but since, since Nazanin uh, raised the issue of the global dimension of the conflict in the Ukraine. Now, if this continues, the potential for, because Ukraine is one of the biggest exporters of grain to the to the world, if it continues and the disruptions continue, we're likely to see more instability, violence and hunger in, uh, in Africa, for example, and then the potential for more displacement to happen. It seems that this is going to invite us to rethink the way we deal with crisis, particularly those with a global dimension. Um, well, I definitely think that um both the, the unfortunate milestone of 100 million displaced people and the war in the Ukraine is giving us sort of another occasion to reassess the way uh, international uh, interventions and responses are, are modeled. Uh, and I do think that, that there is a need for a more holistic approach to, to displacement crises. I think we've, we've already mentioned the, the centrality of the drivers behind uh, displacement. Um, one, one thing I would like to emphasize, both in terms of conflict, conflict prevention and in terms of responses to displacement, is the immense capacities of local communities in the areas that are experiencing displacement to actually uh, host uh, displaced people and, and sort of make do outside the purview of state intervention or the presence of international organizations. So I think that in terms of the, the broader approach to, to responding to these issues, I think there's need for more acknowledgement of the immense resources and, and sort of efforts made locally very close to the displacement situations around the world, uh, where, where local communities are actually receiving people, housing them, providing them with opportunities. And, and I think that broadening the, the view to also include development efforts to, to strengthen those communities is a way to make the responses more sustainable over time. Pavati, a milestone is a number. 100 million remains a figure, a number. In fact, we're talking about 100 million stories, shattered lives, shattered dreams, stories of, ev of, ev of eviction and dispossession. Yet, yet, once again, you get a sense that the, the world cares more about figures not the stories of the people who are the most vulnerable. You're right, and it is a problem. We live in a world where there are many instrumental approaches and priorities, and numbers somehow fit in better than stories. I just want to say one thing. Yes, it's a hundred, you know, we're talking about a hundred million lives and stories of displacement and despair. But those 100 million lives, as long as they are alive, are also 100 million lives of hope. And I think it is absolutely fundamental, and I thank you for flagging up the humanity that is at stake. And the great loss for all of us across the planet, if we do not invest, if governments do not invest more attention, more funds, more resources, more support for these 100 million lives that are lives of great promise and future. It is a great tragedy because many of these are young people. They are the future of this planet. And so it's absolutely fundamental that we humanize the, the refugee and displacement story. Mm -hmm. I also completely agree that we need local authorities to be taken into account, NGOs, questions of place, it's, the low, it's on the ground in particular localities and places and regions that, you know, the actual support and 
uh, resilience is happening. And so it's absolutely fundamental to take into account that um, meeting point, if you like, of people on the move and places that welcome. And there are some good examples of this, for example, in Italy, where we had mayors making you know, arrangements amongst one another when uh, the government was going off in a completely different direction. Mm -hmm. So I think there is this great potential that needs to be paid attention to and tapped into. Nazanin, uh, climate change is definitely going to become a bigger, bigger issue in the upcoming years, more uh, scarcity of water, food, particularly in the African continent. Could this be the moment to change or shift priorities, at least as far as the African Union is concerned? Because they talk about a deadline to silence guns, when I think now it could be the moment to think about how to tackle climate change and its repercussions. Absolutely. Um, we've been waiting for a few years now for the African Union to appoint uh, a climate envoy, um, and they haven't done that yet. And this year is really significant for the African continent, for example, because COP27 will be uh, in Egypt, and many are, are saying that it is going to be an African COP. So it's a really important time and a key time for Africans to have their voices heard but just looking at, at climate change and climate stresses, um, when we talk about migration in the Sahel or here in the Horn, um, it's, it's been a long bit part way of life for people here. Migratory movements across borders um, have been the norm, particularly for herders. But what we've seen in terms of the impact on climate on these movements is the droughts in particular that we've seen and recurring droughts have reduced the ability of these um, populations to move um, because uh, they're left without the resources necessary to move. Um, and this is a huge, huge issue for people uh, who live a semi-nomadic way mm -hmm. of life. Uh, and with these longer dry seasons that we're seeing an increased pressure on water and land, we're seeing a shift in those movements. And that is going to be a huge issue in terms of bringing people into potential situations mm -hmm. where they could end up in conflict. Yes, but the, the issue of drought, long cycles of drought have been straining relations between herders and farmers, ethnic groups in Africa. But it's also creating problem for host nations in different parts of the world. Let me give you an example. In Niger, for example, has its own problems. And then it's flooded with a huge number, an influx of, ref of refugees and displaced uh, people. And people are saying, we cannot handle those problems anymore. That's right. As I said before, I mean, the, the majority of the world's displaced people are hosted in the global south. And many of those uh, uh, regions and communities are also highly vulnerable in, uh, among uh, for among other reasons, because uh, of, of sort of environmental degradation, for example, through droughts. Um, uh, and, and I do just want to emphasize that despite that vulnerability, uh, people are still sort of stepping up to that challenge. And we, I mean, we do see some uh, conflicts arising from the arrival of, of displaced people, but we also see a lot of sol solidarity on the ground. And I just want to emphasize one more thing, which is that uh, in, in sort of uh, thinking about the narrative around refugees globally, I think the key issue in the solidarity we've seen around people displaced from, from the Ukraine now is that they are not only offered asylum, they're also offered the opportunity to work. And what we see, for example, in, in relation to the Syrian refugee crisis, which has been going on for years, is that uh, fairly well-off people with a certain degree of education are kept waiting in asylum procedures for years uh, without being able to work or contribute on their own, which is what most people in the world want to do. So I think that in terms of, of the responses we need to think about, whether it's in the Sahel or in Europe, we do need to think about how we can sort of encourage systems that make that allow for people to create their own lives uh, under these new conditions. And we will definitely continue talking about this particular issue in the near future, at least hoping that one day that staggering number of people who have been evicted from their homes will decrease. Nazanin Moshiri, Jesper Björnsen, Pavati Nair, I really appreciate your insight. Thank you.
And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com, for further discussion. Go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story for me, Hashim Albara, and the entire team here in Doha. Bye for now. <laughs>